In the last episode, we talked about Grendel and the monsters in Beowulf and what it means to be a monster. There's an interesting insight when we get to a biblical explanation for Grendel's mother. And, and what an ingenious monster, right? Not only do we get a monster, but we get the monster's mother. Grendel's mother's reaction is that of a mother's reaction to the murder of her son. Then it became clear, obvious to everyone once the fight was over, that an avenger lurked and was still alive, grimly biding time. Grendel's mother, monstrous hell bride, brooded on her wrongs. She had been forced down into fearful waters, the cold depths after Cain had killed his father's son, felled his own brother with a sword, branded an outlaw, marked by having murdered, he moved into the wilds, shunned company and joy, and from Cain there sprang misbegotten spirits, among them Grendel, the banished and accursed, due to come to grips with that watcher in Harriot waiting to do battle. The passage is rich because we get an allusion to Genesis 4.16, when Cain is banished by God and, quote, dwelt as a fugitive on the earth. Habitavit profugus in terra. And he is a fugitive because of the killing of his brother Abel. But he doesn't disappear into the woods. Genesis says in the next verse that he built a city. Et edificavit kibitatem. It's a rich comment about how this killing in the garden and this city building are connected that somehow murder and civilization go hand in hand. Hrothgar's conquering of his neighbors results in the building of his hall, Herod. And then after the building of Herod, his hall, monsters or misbegotten spirits suddenly appear. But now his mother had sallied forth on a savage journey grief racked and ravenous, desperate for revenge. This is the most explicit description of her motives. But it moves into a larger social sphere. The gap of danger where the demon waits is still unknown to you. Seek it if you dare. I will compensate you for settling the feud. It's become a feud. Now a feud is a quarrel that turns violent. And feuds result in revenge cycles. And certain societies are prone to these revenge cycles. She's looking at the murder, can we say murder, of a monster? And the only optic she can see this through is through a revenge optic. Now notice the mother lacks a name. She's Grendel's mother. In that sense, she generalizes the entire nature of feud societies. Now I want you at this point to listen to how Beowulf's lord describes the 13-year terrorization of Hrothgar's hall. I dreaded the outcome of your expedition and pleaded with you long and hard to leave the killer be. Let the South Danes settle their own blood feud with Grendel. What is a blood feud? This is where pagan cultures of honor and Christian notions of forgiveness come into play. Feuds were personal conflicts, right? The spilling of blood. Violent counter reactions that draw in all of society because they defend a man and a group's honor. And to maintain your honor, you need to defend it through violence. Now, the kings have tried to limit this spread of violence, to stop this violence, to avoid the endless 
revenge cycles. And so a system was set up where payments could be made, but also peace pledges in order to seize revenge. This is where we get back to the beginning of the book. In my whole life, I have never seen meat enjoyed more in any hall on earth. Talking about Herod. Sometimes the queen herself appeared, peace pledge between nations, to hearten the young ones and hand out a torque or gift to a warrior, then take her place. And Hrothgar, conscious of bad blood in conquering his lands, marries a woman from another group and she becomes the living embodiment of a peace pledge, a deal, between two warring nations. No, let's make it clear because of the way this book functions. Not between two warring nations, between the winners and the losers. And the losers are always nursing their wounds. Now, Hrothgar's own daughter will in turn become a peace pledge. But what happens to Freyawarn, his daughter, when she appears in another hall? That is, hey, in another... Here. We have dinner guests, so hold on one second. That was an interruption, but let's keep going. What happens to Freyawarn, his daughter, when she appears in another hall, that is, another city, keep thinking about Cain. She's among the losers, among Hrothgar's subdued enemy. The friend of the Shieldings favors her betrothal. The guardian of the kingdom sees good in it and hopes this woman, Hrothgar's daughter, will heal old wounds and grievous feuds. But generally, the spear is prompt to retaliate when a prince is killed. That's revenge, no matter how admirable the bride may be. Think how the Hethobards are bound to feel. Their lord Ingeld and his loyal thanes, that's his lords, when he walks in with that woman to the feast. Now, this is a moment of descriptio. It's, it's all going to be in the historic present. Danes are at the table, being entertained. You can start to visualize it. Honored guests in glittering regalia. Burnished rain mail that was their host's birthright. Looted when the heathen bard, Hatho bards, could no longer wield their weapons in the shield clash. That's the battle. When they went down with their beloved comrades, that means killed and forfeited their lives. Then an old spearman, that's an old veteran, will speak while they're drinking, having glimpsed some heirloom, like a ring or something, that brings alive memories of the massacre. His mood will darken, mood, also his thoughts, and heart-stricken in the stress of his emotion, he will begin to test a young man's temper and stir up trouble. We're seeing a human monster spring out of his own vengeful mire. We are seeing misshapen humans. Here's the veteran speaking. And now here's a son of one or other of those same killers coming through our hall, overbearing us, mouthing boasts, and rigged in armor that by right is yours. And so he keeps on recalling and accusing working things up with bitter words until one of the lady's retainers lies spattered in blood, split open on his father's account. The killer knows the lie of the land and escapes with his life. Then on both sides, the oath-bound lords will break the peace. A passionate hate will build up an ingeld, and love for his bride will falter in him as the feud rankles. The killer becomes Cain the original fugitive in the woods, or Grendel waging his lonely war. The peace is broken and the city burns. Remember, Hrothgar's city is going to burn. This is what the poet means when he tells us that Hrothgar's 
own in-laws will destroy the hall. All this confirms that the poet is thinking of human monsters, doesn't it? And he includes some more monsters. Do you remember these monsters? Like the pariah king, Hermod, who cut himself off from his own kind? That's a monster. Or even the bad queen, Madrith, who'd torture and kill anyone who would look at her. But she at least reforms. That's another example of the text's uh, tension between the honor code of the, its pagan past and the imperative of Christianity to forgive your enemy. The most revealing example is Hrothgar's advice to Beowulf. There's a moment of self-realization. He begins talking about God. It is a great wonder how Almighty God and His magnificence favors our race with rank and scope and the gift of wisdom. His sway is wide. Sometimes He allows the mind of a man of distinguished birth to follow its bent, grants him fulfillment and felicity or happiness on earth, and forts to command in his own country. God permits him to lord it in many lands until the man in his unthinkingness, this is where pride kicks in, forgets that it will ever end for him. This is the illusion of power, right? He indulges his desires. Illness and old age mean nothing to him, right? Even though those are the things that are coming. His mind is untroubled by envy or malice or the thought of enemies with their hate-honed swords. The whole world conforms to his will. That's very dangerous. He is kept from the worst until an element of overweening enters him and takes hold. This is where the devil starts to kick in. While the soul's guard, its sentry drowses, grown too distracted, a killer stalks him. This is Grendel, right? Or the devil, an archer who draws a deadly bow. And then the man is hit in the heart. And, and then the man is hit in the heart. The arrow flies beneath his defenses. The devious promptings of the demon start. His old possessions seem paltry to him now, right? Because now he has envy and he's full of greed. He covets and resents dishonors custom and bestows no gold. In other words, he's hoarding gold. He's not sharing it anymore. It's like the dragon. And because of good things that the heavenly powers gave him in the past, he ignores the shape of things to come. Then, finally, the end arrives. When the body he was lent collapses and falls, prey to its death. Then, finally, the end arrives ignores the shape of things to come, right? As heaven, or even hell, judgment. Then finally the end arrives, when the body he was lent collapses and falls prey to its death. Ancestral possessions, that's all that he owned, and the goods he hoarded are inherited by another who lets them go with a liberal hand. In other words, his heir is generous, but he wasn't. Beowulf seems to do just that. He seems to be a great leader. But like any leader whose territory is dependent on the subjugation of others, his kingdom is also under attack. First by a greedy dragon, and that's the hobbit's dragon, right? Bilbo Baggins, remember, is the cup stealer. And he defeats the dragon. And then afterwards, when he dies, that's when the lady sings a wild litany of nightmares and lament, her nation invaded, enemies on the rampage, bodies in piles, slavery in a basement. How are you gonna stop that? The book ends caught in this revenge cycle. There are going to be more and more monsters. In the next episode, we are now gonna be moving into Middle English. Alright guys, don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that notification bell.